St. Green this morning uh, at 8 o'clock was 18 CFS, the 125 year historic average is about 35 CFS for this date. Um, the call on the St. Green um, is the rough and ready ditch um, and that's an 1869 um, water rate. The call on the South Platte River is Jackson Reservoir um, and the priority date of that is the 2004 um, water rate. Uh, Ralph Price Reservoir is at an elevation of 6396.6. That's about four feet down, um, or about 743 acre feet. Uh, Union Reservoir is at a gauge height of 21.9, or, um, and that's about, we'll see, seven feet down. That's about 4,000 acre feet down. Uh, Right now, the select St. Green reservoirs at the end of September were 67% of full. If we look back uh, last year at the same time, um, the reservoirs were about 75% of full. Um, yeah, it was a hot, dry fall, and we brought down those reservoirs quite a bit. So, questions for Kevin? Thanks, Kevin. Yep. We have a living body to be heard today. I don't believe so. We have one who is presenting with hope later, and Councilmember Christ is with us. You are. Well. I'm Courtney Black with the Bureau. Okay. Very good. Okay, any agenda revisions? I have none. Very well. Okay, Wes, it's a big one for you development activity. So, yeah, nothing, nothing to put in front of the board today. Okay, that's good. Okay, any general business, legislative value and water principles. Um, Alex, you want to yes, uh, a little bit for us? Yeah, so as the 2025 legislative session approaches, uh, we, the staff, would like to discuss with the board Longmont guiding water principles and any input you may have regarding them. Uh, the attachment below that page uh, shows the water principles of 2025, the proposed water principles for 2025 um, as passed by the water board last year. Uh, these guiding water principles allow the evaluation of how proposed bills may impact the city and its residents, and we come here asking for the board's revision and approval of these principles for 2025. Review, revision, and approval. Can you... Uh mention any significant or maybe changes from where we were before? I mean, they're pretty much the same. Yeah, the these, are, these are the exact same as they were last year. Exactly. The okay. date changed? Yes, that's <laughs> 2024 changed to 2025. We, we made some Which revisions. Which earlier, didn't you last night? <laughs> we made some revisions in 2024, right? Yeah. So this document. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. But as passed, okay. by the board last Correct. year, they're the same. So, any comments about the name thing? I'm fine with the way they are. Okay. I am as well. Right. I, I think we did a pretty good job. I, I know that there are some interesting things contemplated to come before the legislature that would be water related, but I think that we're covered well with the uh, principles that we adopted previously. Yeah. I want to make a motion to approve. 
I move that we approve the water principles. I would second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, Alex. No problem. Okay. Um, this is your master plan. Hope. Yeah, I'm great. Just you and No, but I can join and then um, share my screen. Oh. Okay. Uh, you want me to call you? Yeah. Good idea, Chris. Well, the other thing you can do is a wireless connect. Well, well, just call me. Then I don't know, know if this is going to work. Just scroll down to my chat and then call me. Because I'm in the meeting. Oh, well, that in this meeting. present meeting. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that may be why it won't call you. That's strange. What is going on? Yeah, do you have an HDMI? Um, we have wireless. Let me switch it over to you. Okay.
pressure. <laughs> Magic is about to happen, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the <laughs> intermission. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so we're here to present on our 2024 update, our water efficiency plan. And I'm here with Courtney. Um, she's the principal invest, uh, invest engineer, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> for Intera. Uh, and she is a highly experienced water consultant who prepares these plans for lots of utilities across Colorado. She also worked with Peter, our um, other consultant who worked on this plan who's not here, Peter Mayer. Um, he's the principal investigator for Water Resource Foundation, Water Research Foundation, and he's working on the residential end use study version three. Um, and he also worked on our 2012 and 2017 water efficiency plans. Um, and then so Courtney worked with Peter to create this, and she's also created the efficiency plan guidance documents for the CWCB. So why, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but why do we want to do water efficiency in Longmont? Um, first and foremost, we want to be leaders of sustainability in our community. Um, coordinated water stewardship, working amongst departments interdepartmentally, preparing ourselves for climate change and creating resiliency and reliability, um, making sure we have diverse, healthy uh, outdoor environments, reducing our carbon footprint, the delay and expansion of future infrastructures and to preserve our local um, agriculture. And so when we're talking about water efficiency planning in Longmont, um, you know, I'm speaking of the choir here too, Longmont's had a long history of water efficiency planning and conservation itself. Um, the first plan being done back in 1996. So this is the fifth update to sequence of water conservation plans you put together. Um, it is required by the state, by statute, to have a state-approved water efficiency plan if you sell over 2,000 acre feet. Um, and so this is going to the state for final approval to be in compliance with that statute at the end of this. Um, to kind of go back in history a little bit, one of the key goals of the 2017 plan was to reduce customer water use demands by approximately 10% by build-out, build-out being in 2048. And uh, this, is, this has been accomplished. Um, you guys have achieved that goal. And in 2024 of this year, um, um, savings are due to specific measures and programs have been estimated at about 143 acre feet. Um, moving forward into um, this plan that all of you have had a chance to, to look at, um, if you have had time to look at it, um, we're really calling for saving additional water, and that is in the form of looking at a per capita water use metric of reducing that by about an additional 3% on average by 2030, so over the course of the next seven years. Um, a huge component of that will be reducing irrigated non-functional turf on city properties, as well as continuing to expand your raw water irrigation on city properties. Another goal is really integrating water efficiency across city departments. Um, we're seeing more and more of this with water providers throughout the state of really looking at how you can integrate water, water into land use planning as well as just holistically how can you implement a program where you're taking the advantages of various departments across the city and going from that. And then also promoting water efficient, efficiency equitably. And to get a little bit more into the details of what that's entailing, that's helping ensure all people have access to safe drinking water. Um, encouraging this distribution, the economic, social, and environmental benefits across all sectors of the community. Uh, promoting resiliency to climate risks such as flood and droughts and wildfires. And then providing all members of the community to um, meaningfully participate in water efficiency related decision making processes and making that, sure that information is translated appropriately. Let me ask you a quick question. It looks like you went for one measurement. 2017 goals to another, I mean, percent. I assume that's raw 10%, and then you went per capita. Um, that's a different way of measuring, right? It's using, it's using different metrics, yes. Um, partially, and can please feel to elaborate on this in terms of just 
historically looking at, looking at um, the 10% based on build out is a little more difficult to message from a public messaging standpoint and to explain. And so that's why we opted to choose a different metric moving forward. But essentially, if you do all the calculations and look at it, you're still working with similar, same types of numbers. It's just a different metric to look at it. I, I just think per capita would be a more equitable way to measure, but that's just my opinion. So anyway, I'm curious. Thanks. And so some data, uh, this really tells the story in terms of just historically where Longmont's been at. The Green Line is showing increasing population since 1996, which is no surprise you're a growing community. And so you've definitely seen across increasing population as you've continued to develop. Um, the pretty cool thing is that if you're looking at the, the total water produced, and those are the, the light blue bars here in the graphic, um, you're not seeing an increase in total water production. You're actually, if you're looking at kind of the 2000 to 2012 mark, and you compare those to the 20, uh, uh, the 2011 to 2023, it's actually lower. And that's an indication that per capita water use has been decreasing and really speaks to the city of Longmont's efforts in reducing water use over time via conservation and other measures. Um, we go to the next slide. <coughs> And you can see this starting in 2013 out to 2023. This is the per capita water use that has been observed with, via the billing data. And um, you can see a, a certain level of reduction over that course period historically. And also, as I mentioned with the goal, now we're looking for achieving additional savings of 3% in the next seven years. And so now getting into more of the, the knit and grid of the plan, if you go to table 5.1 in your water efficiency plan, this table is a good summary table of what Longmont is planning on doing over the course of the next seven years. And it's divided into these seven or eight categories. These categories are kind of the, the latest and greatest in terms of looking at different groupings of different water efficiency strategies across the state. It comes from Colorado Rises Best Practice Guides document for municipal conservation. So we have planning and implementation strategies, strategies related to measurement data, rates and charges, codes and regs. Also focusing in our, on the indoor water use efficiency piece, the outdoor public outreach, and then raw and reused water. Raw water is not necessarily saving molecules of water, but what it does is it's not treated water. So it doesn't have to go through the water treatment plant, which does save energy. And then reuse, and Longmont's looking to optimize this, the amount of reused water they can based on existing water rights portfolio. So, um, and so I just mentioned the table here. Um, this is a seven year plan, and why it's seven years is the state requires um, for water providers to update their plan every seven years. So we're really focusing in on a seven year planning horizon and then this plan will be updated again. Um, so there's an implementation plan as well as there's a water efficiency monitoring plan. The monitoring plan really looks at on a regular basis of what kind of programs and measures Longline has been implementing, how, how, is that, how are water <coughs> demands responding, and looking at what's working well, what do we want to continue moving forward with over the next seven years, and then are there areas where there's lessons learned of things we can tweak. So there's continual looking at that over the course of the next seven years to continue to fine tune the plan over time. What's new in this plan? One is really focusing on landscapes, on raw water, and on turf replacement. Another is really starting to take a closer look using the AWWA M36 auditing measures on um, annual water loss audits and, and validating that and those are that's you know best standard practices that are out there for that. Um, peak demand management through irrigation timing shifts. So focusing in on city properties, a lot of times cities will do this by doing an odd even irrigation schedule across all like, residential customers for instance. But there's a there's a sufficient enough use of water that's going for say parks irrigation of parks and such that um, being able just to shift, and the city has direct control over this, or what the irrigation schedules are, we're anticipating that we'll see some reduction in peak demands, which is, is great news. Is, is that the extent of your peak demand management at this time? Is parks and irrigation timing? It's, yes, so we're focusing at moving forward, right now we do nothing. <laughs> 
So yes. I know it's an improvement. Yeah, yeah. Yay. So um, <laughs> let me, this let me rephrase that. This is a great improvement. Thanks. Do you have any plans to go residential? <laughs> yeah, eventually. Okay. We're gonna start, and and that's part of what we feel is important in our programming is being that role model. I don't want to be like you guys can't water, you know, during these times when we're watering our parks during these times. Cool. Like that. Are you finding that parks are able to do it? Um, we haven't begun doing it. This okay. is our draft plan, so welcome any comments and feedback. Okay. Um, but yes, this is one of the, the, the measures that we're hoping to implement moving forward. Okay. But um, we have started engaging parks in an informal discussion way, and I think we can figure something out. Okay, very cool. Oh, so related to that, um, Residents engage me to engage parks. Yes, that's a big part of that too. Watering is because if somebody sees mm -hmm. this park sprinklers running at 10 a.m. or noon, they write me a letter. That's yeah. the way it works. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the answer I've gotten back in past years has been, well, you know, our sprinkler system just isn't good enough to get everything watered earlier in the day. Yeah. Um, but then we've been replacing the automation in the sprinkler systems for the last, what, three years? We've been up five years, years. Five years, something like that. So you're probably coming in the right time in, to, to actually make that improvement. Um, yeah, so. and part of that, again, is addressing our peak demand, which is 2 a.m. on Monday mornings. Um, yeah, so that's part part of that that's driving this big one. But um, yeah, sorry to interrupt. No, no, good question. And then our last one here is engaging the land use planning to better integrate water. And um, this is something that the state has really been um, promoting over the course of the past five years of um, how can how can water be integrated with just looking at the future and where future developments are going to look like and ordinary planning departments be able to do that. For instance, not putting in Kentucky bluegrass right with new development as opposed to putting it in and then say tearing it out five years or replacing it. So this is, is going to be, can be viewed as much more an economic approach to things. I have a question about that too. Because I and it's probably I should probably be going to do that with this. Um, because uh, I, I just answered a resident letter about that. It's like, why do you let um, the neighborhoods have all of this bluegrass? And you know, so I told them the real state of play about this. You know, that that HOAs are no longer allowed to force homeowners to have lawns. Um, but I don't believe that we currently have the ability to force HOAs to use native turf. Does anybody know the answer to that before I go to Grant, since we're talking about it? Yeah, I, so moving forward, starting in 2026, the state is no longer allowing anyone to, to um, implement non-functional turf. So that means business parks, um, right-of-ways, those types of things. Mm -hmm. As far as in HOAs, we don't that is functional. Um, we'll see where we go with our tree lawns, but um, do you want to answer this in better way? I mean, right now, state statutes is required on non-residential. And on the residential side of things, it's still really up to the residents on and HOAs on what they, what they want to do. Yeah. That said, there's a lot of efforts throughout the state of starting to really hone in on educating HOAs and different Providers have different ways in which how they're going about doing that okay. in their area. But I, guess, as I, I do not, the question is really do we have a right to refuse to permit a development that doesn't promise not to plant bluegrass? Well, I don't think we do, but that, that's, the, that's the question. Yeah. <coughs> There's so little new development, you know. Permits that I'm not sure it makes much difference. You know. yeah, we're, not, we're not finding the single family home with a lot of development. Right, well, with yeah. A lot of yeah people, people are doing that by themselves. I mean, they're tearing out their turf at a pretty good clip, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Hope's been really good about putting together a growing water smart effort at Longmont, which is the first step you have to do. And then, um, you know, we're trying to work on the city non-essential turf, and then just with the state language, we're able to go beyond that with uh, commercial and uh, like some some other areas. But it, it doesn't go all the way to residential. Um, but I think as the growing water smart effort goes forward, we're looking at the city code, and we have we have to change the city code first. And that's Development code. Um, that's that's a that's an effort, uh, but we think we'll get there. And we're working on it. Yeah. There's an active. We're working on it. It'll happen someday. It will. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's actually a great segue for our next slide, which is to just talk about our current existing programs. Um, so currently, we partner with Resource Central and Efficiency Works as our, um, to help me run these programs. So Resource Central, we do slow the flow irrigation assessments, garden in a box discounts, waterwise yard seminars, and of course our turf replacements, which are super popular. And those are, again, on those residential um, properties. For efficiency works, we do um, rebates and discounts for both indoor and outdoor efficiency fixtures, such as toilets, aerators, and shower heads, and then for our outdoor sprinkler heads, rain sensors, irrigation controllers, drip conversion kits, those types of things. Um, our multifamily and commercial programs, um, we're working with Northern Water to do indoor assessments for free for all commercial properties. So we've been able to do um, several city buildings actually, which have been really great um, to have uh, pretty in-depth indoor water assessments done. Um, for Resource Central, we do um, slow the flow irrigation audits on commercial and HOA properties. So HOAs are, um, are qualified for our commercial programs because of their meter size, so they're able to do those irrigation audits, which are really popular as well. Um, and then, of course, water-wise yard seminars are open to everybody. Um, and then efficiency works, they can do um, toilets, aerators, commercial size clothes, wash clothes washers, ice machines, pre-rinse valves, and commercial dishwashers, all those things that those businesses and restaurants need to make their um, businesses more efficient, we can we give them discounts and rebates for those as well. And so, um, kind of in conclusion here, um, as I mentioned, um, we are going to be submitting this to state for it to be approved, and it will be meeting CWC mm -hmm. requirements. Um, it's based on Colorado's best practice guidebook for municipal water efficiency, and uh, so it meets, it meets state requirements, it's well the state requirements, as well as on a national level, um, the American Water Association, Association's G48020 Water Conservation Program and Management Standards. So that's national standards. So essentially, Longmont's got a robust, a robust plan for the state and the national level. So now we can open it up for questions and discussions. I also just w lastly wanted to say that we, I worked with comms to do um, an outreach plan and we were able to launch an online survey for people to go online, look at the full plan and um, or an, a summary, executive summary um, online and then do um, outreach and engagement on an online survey. So I will send those. We just launched it. We launched it right before this meeting as this is our public engagement launch period. So we'll send you all the link for that if you want to or we can put your feedback. But um, yeah, it would actually be great if you guys want to take the survey because we're surveying on more than just our efficiency plan. We're, we're also asking about future water programming and um, there's questions about what type of landscapes the community um, prefers, so it's going to be a good public engagement opportunity. Let me ask you a question about what we're building in Longmont today versus what we were a decade ago. Not a lot of residential property with lots of lawns is happening today. I can't help but think that that would help our water efficiency numbers 
people aren't watering lawn, lawns there. I mean, there's a lot of savings there. Is that an impact that is reality? I mean, is that true? Yes, that's very true. <laughs> uh, and, and you can see that reflected in the per capita numbers that uh, yeah. we're seeing over time. That um, it, it definitely over the last 25, 30 years, we have gone from an average of a 7,000 square foot lot to 10,000 square foot lot uh, down to, gosh, some of them are 25 feet wide by less than 100 feet deep, so less than 2,500 yeah. square feet for a lot. Um, and most of that is house. So you have a postage stamp of lawn and uh, maybe some pots that they're irrigating. Um, and most of these are falling into uh, what have been historically PUDs or planned unit developments. Um, where they can uh, more efficiently irrigate uh, around the homes. Um, so each home is not really irrigating anything. Um, that it's, their irrigation system is part of a larger irrigation system for the entire development. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, uh, I'd say our developments have less green space than they did previously um, and more living unit per, per lot. Yeah. I just assumed that was what was happening, and uh, it's just the way it is. So it, that means less water per capita, obviously, and that's what we're trying to head. But uh, so, all right. I'll follow up on that, Chris. So, um, it seems to me that that simultaneous with that good news, we probably face higher losses, system losses, as our infrastructure is old. Right, and there's a, ultimately a replacement plan for the system, but you can't do that all at one time. It takes decades, right? Do we have a good handle on what our actual losses are? Because I'm not sure if we talked a lot about that at Water Board recently. Yeah, we do our, the AWWA M36 water loss audit. We've been doing yeah. it since 2019, um, and then the past two years we've been getting it validated. So we do have all of that, and um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can get those numbers to you guys. Yeah. It, it, it tells half part of the story, right? I mean, the, the total yeah. system use is both what's used and what's would have been used had it not been lost along the way somewhere, right? So, right. Uh, if I'm remembering right, Hope, we're somewhere around 10% uh, loss. Which would be kind system. of typical for a system like this, but I, I just haven't seen a lot of data, so that'd be nice to see at some point. Yeah, we, we did bring to the, the city council with our rate study uh, assessment of our cast iron and other yeah. materials in, in the system uh, and we have requested a fairly substantial increase in our replacement um, CFPs. Uh, I think we've been averaging somewhere around two to three million dollars a year and we're moving up to the eight to ten million dollars a year for replacements. Uh, so we hope to keep ahead of that and uh, we don't uh, skyrocket in our, in our losses. So. Any questions? Well, Courtney and Hope, thank you for your presentation. Can you send those surveys though? I'd like yes. to go through yes, that. Please. Yeah, I'm really it's excited easier than giving you feedback at a table situation to look at it. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Cool. I invite your friends and neighbors to participate too. <laughs> we, we were looking at our past. Uh, our past engagement rates, and I think last year we had like six comments on the plan, so I know we you can beat that. that. <laughs> I know we can do it. It's going to be great. Yes. I can beat that. Me yes. <laughs> well, you have three more here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, when you have update. Okay, um, I'll, I'll try to make this quick. I've got quite a few slides, so <laughs> I'll, I'll be running through the slides a little quick. First thing I want to do is um, show the water board, um, we get this update from Northern Water um, each month, and uh, let me look. You should just scroll down. Can I just scroll down? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Um, couple, couple things. Uh, I think we even reported this last month. All the grounding for the project um, on the main dam has been completed. One of the nice things about the re updates now is we're starting to, to say this part of the project's done and that part of the project's done, which is, which is really good. Um, the upstream tunnel piping and backfill is all complete. The, 
you know, you basically you've got the dam and you've got the inlet and outlet tunnel and pipes to the biggest parts of really of the project. Um, they've actually started on the inlet outlet tower in the dam. There'll be an outlet tower, uh, huge structure because <laughs> it's got about 350 some feet tall, um, and it's going to be um, quite a quite a project just in of itself. But that's really the one of the critical things to get done um, before you can start putting water in the reservoir because uh, it, it's at the very bottom, you know, you've got to start there. Um, the downstream tunnel works is, is a little bit, um, slowing down a little bit. Uh, the spillway box culverts are all complete. There's still some open channel spillway work yet, yet to do. Um, and the saddle dam, this was the start of the month, was 14 foot tall, of course, yeah, definitely include the part a little great. Um, it was 26 feet to go, or now less than 20 feet to go on the saddle spillway, so that, that helps a lot. Um, on the main dam, uh, it's over, well, a couple weeks ago it was 268, so it's around 275 feet tall now. Um, you can definitely see it even if you drive up the county road on the back side. Uh, more now. Um, five to six lifts of asphalt still going in per week. As water guys, we don't like the dry fall, but <laughs> as, a, as a project, it, we could have had a better fall uh, for construction. Um, only, really, only one issue right now is the uh, uh, crusher uh, capacity. Um, as the dam goes up, you have less large rock fill on each side, and you end up with the ability to produce enough finely crushed material for the asphalt in the zone three, the small, the small filter lens is right next to the asphalt core. And so um, they're, that's really kind of what's going or the critical path right now is getting enough crushed rock um, for that. Um, this, um, as part of the project, the project has to connect, or is going to connect into the Carter Lake pressure conduit. Um, this is a picture of, of where it will connect. They dug up the pressure conduit that goes from the flat iron power plant to the pumping plant that pumps water up to Carter Lake. So we're not getting any water in Carter Lake right now. It's going to be a little while before water will flow into Carter Lake. Right now, all the water that's coming down the project's going up to a horse tooth reservoir. Um, but it's pretty amazing to see that pipe and how, how large that inlet pipe is to Carter Lake. There will be a major uh, valve vault right here. Um, this allows a number of things. One is um, you can fill Carter Lake now with lar a large diameter pipe with the pipeline fills. Jimmy Hall can also now fill Carter Lake. So if there ever is an outage on the flat iron pumping plant, um, we'll still be able to fill Carter Lake. We, we did have a number of years ago had um, an explosion in that pumping plant that put us out of, out of water. We couldn't pump for like six or eight months, or a while, um, and Carter was pretty low. <laughs> So that's a, a real safety and redundancy feature. And also, if Carter's down and Chimney Hall is full, you'll be able to run water by gravity from Chimney Hall to Carter Lake. So a lot of different things that that, that does. But, um, that just kind of gives you a scale. When you see the worker right here, <laughs> that kind of gives you a scale, a scale for some of that stuff. Going in. Um, this is the control, the main control house valve vault. Um, the vault, the vault, the valves are in there now, um, and, and the steel and the roof is going up, so it won't be long before. It's hoped that that's completely enclosed, you know, so that it can continue, or it can continue uninterrupted to clear through the winter. So that'll be good um, for that to happen. Uh, finally, the um, contingency, uh, currently 76 million. Uh, budget of contingency that's for, from the start of the project today. And there's still um, uh, there's 
still 23% um, uncommitted contingency. So we're, we're still doing pretty good um, from that standpoint. Uh, as far as the construction schedule, um, this is the, the, the good, I'll call it the good fall, late summer fall has helped them actually get ahead of the, the projection, the upper lines, the fastest projection of orange lines, the um, uh, hopefully lowest projection. We're, we're right up here right now. So still looking at an August um, 25 completion, but it looks like we're about a month ahead of schedule right now. So, so that's pretty good. Um, so that project is going very well. The other main project as part of the Windy Gap firming project is the Colorado River Connectivity Channel. And I wanted to spend a little more time today on, I mean, we've talked about that in the past, but um, the project had a, a ribbon cutting and grand opening um, last week. So we're very excited about that. It's fully functional. The contractor's doing a little bit of cleanup work, but should be out in the next few weeks uh, and have this project completely uh, finished. And I'll just <clears throat> point out a couple elements on it. So this, this is kind of A, a little bit of our west slope mitigation. Um, the, the, when the original Windy Gap Diversion project was built. The dam went clear across the valley, clear over to the railroad tracks here. In fact, you can see what was um, the south abutment, south embankment, and then it came from here. It came all the way across here. This is the spillway for the Windy Gap Ferry project. So basically, the entire entire valley was was reservoir. Um, so the, fir the connectivity channel was installing a, a containment dike uh, dam right down the middle of the current, then current reservoir, and then constructing the uh, connectivity channel on this side. Um, used quite a bit of almost half of the, a little bit less than half, but almost half of the reservoir's site so that we uh, could do a much better job uh, of creating that connectivity channel. Just to kind of point things out, use this tree line is the Colorado River. This tree line is the Fraser River. Their confluence is right here, just immediately upstream of where um, the connectivity channel starts. And then the connectivity, the main part of it is right here. Highway 40 goes out to Granby to Kremlin. You can literally drive on Highway 40, pull over the side of the road, and all the structures right down below you. So if you ever want to, if you ever get over there, spend a few minutes, you know, stop on the side of the road there, and take a look at it. But um, this is where it diverts water and then it's either diverted into the uh, Windy Gap Reservoir or on around through the connectivity channel. The connectivity channel will always have water in it. Um, you can see they did a really good job about recreating a lot of natural features of a uh, natural stream and that that has already um, it's it's functioned so well they've documented a really great migration of fish up up and back and um, there's a small fish called a sculpin little tiny guy that um, most most fishermen never even see because <laughs> you know they don't fish for them um, they're considered one of the worst swimmers there are. And so um, they, were, they were not even found in the river above Windy Gap um, before this work, and they're already, they've made it all the way through this uh, connectivity channel, which is, is um, significant. Um, just some uh, pictures. So this, this you can see um, the confluence is right here, up above it. So this is looking upstream from uh, the, the structure. This is the gate. Now this is, you know, the gate here is a, is a flood gate. So normally the flow will go down the connectivity channel and the amount of water needed for to pump, to either both fill the reservoir and to pump, 
um, will be will come just off the side of it. This gate will, will actually be normally up, and then um, if there's a major flood, it, it will lower so that the flood can go through the Windy Gap Reservoir and over the spillway so that it doesn't tear up the connectivity channel um, because we don't want to lose that. Here's looking downstream. Uh, you can see this picture was, so that much of the gate is on each side of the picture. This concrete block right here, that is where the gate is that allows the water to go into, so that'll take the, the normal flows while this is normally open. You can see a lot of really good design features in this project. So now you're just starting to see the connectivity channel here. And you can see it's going to normally take the flows and it's going to, going to function real good. One interesting, at least for me, an interesting note was this um, training wall. Clear across the river and this training wall goes almost all the way over to the railroad tracks. Um, that will, will help keep um, when, when the Colorado River gets up above this channel and goes over bank, it'll keep it from tearing up that, um, that channel. So that, that was a really good feature. I, I, just for me, <laughs> from an engineering standpoint, like this is standing at the same place, looking downstream, and you can see the, the what was the Colorado River <laughs> before the project, and this is the channel that'll go into the Windy Gap Reservoir. And this is the channel where we'll deliver water um, out of this structure uh, downstream. Now this is the first, uh, I'm just going to take you real quick through some pictures of the connectivity channel because it's actually a pretty long channel. So there's a number of pictures here. But you can see some of the features. They put some uh, woody debris as, as a bed anchor um, on, on the outside of where the water will go around. Um, there's there's a little more need to be here. Um, you can see some a lot of vegetation just starting. There was I think what he said 17,500 plants planted as part of this. Um, but you can really see the natural character, the riffles, the calmer parts. Um, there's a good riffle there. Uh, going on down, uh, and you can just see right here they actually created a. a dual channel, uh, kind of replicate what you'll find a lot of times in nature. There's, and, and both of them are functioning. When it gets really low, it'll just be one of the two channels running. Um, and then that's the, the smaller of the two channels. You can see the embankment, the new embankment is right here. And right there is the, where the uh, old embankment went. You're in what would have been the bottom of the reservoir before this project was um, constructed. And that may be all of it because I think it all didn't come in. <laughs> that's okay. We're fine. Um, so anyway, that's that's the connectivity channel. Been very, you know, been working very well. Everybody's excited. Um, well, it's expensive. <laughs> uh, partially because you had to, you know, completely build a whole new embankment, but um, that's one of the real critical parts of, of the uh, project and the mitigation on the west slope. Um, that's also one of the issues that um, shows not only did the project do environmental mitigation, but it did enhancement work. Um, so the Colorado River will be better off, actually, after this project is constructed. So. Um, that's kind of where we are right now with uh, Wendy Gap. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Is there? Is it pretty much completed? Any? It is. Yeah, they're just doing cleanup work. It's it's been functioning all summer. Been running water through it all summer, or all, almost a year now. But mm -hmm. it, it worked really good last spring and summer, and uh, uh, very successful. Yeah. Any questions? No? Okay, thanks, Ken. Okay, water rate fee update. Okay. Um, okay, either you're going to call me? Is that... I'm going to try to switch you over like we did before. Okay. There's 
Can I, just plug, can I just plug an HDMI cable into this, into my laptop? Uh, I don't have an HDMI cable. Okay. starting for some reason. Can you talk while it's re reloading? So uh, I am Lance Smith, uh, and I'm going to introduce a little bit of the rate study that we did for 2025 through 2029. Um, I'm really just 
repeating a presentation I gave to council on September 3rd, um, at which I was asking for a little bit of direction because there were two rate options being presented, a three-year schedule and a five-year schedule. Um, City Council did recommend that we go with a three-year schedule, um, so I'll talk about that a bit in a minute. Um, this was something that, that we've been working on for the whole year, so we went to Council in May to, to give them an update of the initial need. Um, we then talked to City Council in July about our capital improvement plans um, and some significant capital projects we had um, that are kind of outside the norm there. Um, then in September, um, I updated them with this presentation on the cost of service findings and proposed rates. Um, then this month, uh, we went for first reading on October 2nd or 8th, 8th October 8th, I think. Um, yeah, and so we're going to go for second reading tomorrow night on the 22nd. Um, those are the proposed rate ordinances, and the rates would go into effect January 1st. Um, and feel free to stop me along the way if you've got questions. Um, but initially, I was reminding, I talked to council in May, talked about where we were at as far as operating income, which is the green line there is the operating revenues, and the red line is the operating expense. The space in between them is the operating income. Um, that operating income is used to pay debt service. Um, it's also um, there to fund capital improvement projects, um, system renewal projects primarily. Um, and as you can see, particularly in 2023, that gap, that space closed significantly. Um, and so that suggests that uh, we have less money available for capital work. Um, now in July, um, Chris and, and Joe and John talked about the, the capital improvement plan. Um, there's kind of normal system renewal work that, that needs to happen every year. And that's really wrapped up in the 15 plus additional CIPs there for that $26 million over this five year period. So that's a little over $5 million a year we would be spending on capital work, um, which is about one fifth or about 20% of operating revenue um, but then you see the four projects above that that also need to happen in this five-year window um, for 147 million dollars outside of that normal um, capital program um, and so that 147 million dollars there um, is more than we will take in in operating revenue, so there will need to be debt associated with these, these projects. Um, and these projects are what I was calling kind of generational projects, so we won't be uh, building, you know, another uh, treated water storage tank or reservoir over the next 40 or 50 years. Um, that cast iron pipe, that's the main line pipes that serve our community. Um, again, you don't replace those very often, so kind of once in a generation you would replace those. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, and then there's the Nelson Flanders um, water treatment plant expansion. Um, there's also site improvements associated with that. Um, and so we've got about $30 million of site improvements, and then we would be ready to do the actual expansion, build out the, the process train. Um, and again, you won't do that maybe once every 50 or so years. So, um, well, What's the dates on the expansion start date? And, and so, uh, so what I'll talk about here in the rate study is that we've We've looked at a number of, so there are a number of rate pressures here, and one of the things we looked at was delaying capital as long as we could. Um, and so the Nelson Flanders uh, expansion, we've delayed until 2029, which is the last year that the, our demand projections say we can wait. So we anticipate doing that project, beginning that project in 2029, Chris? Yes. Yeah. Any downside? 
to the, I don't want to call it the delay, but I mean, are there any issues waiting until then? Um, yeah, financially, we don't know what's going to happen in the next five years, so there's a financial risk there. Um, operationally, I think Chris will speak to that. Yeah, operationally, um, we don't have a chart that shows us right now, but uh, our, our peak demands are still below um, the peak operation of the plant, um, and we've held that since, I want to say 2007, 2008, I think, was our peak uh, of 36 MGD. Um, the th I mean, we're rated at 40 MGD on the plant right now, so as long as things stay normal, um, that we don't have a drought, and that uh, I will say that since that time, I think that we have operationally uh, looked at the way that we operate our tanks and our system, uh, which has helped uh, keep that peak uh, below a uh, threshold of around 32 to 33 MGD. So we, we have some buffer, we have some space. Um, it, it does not necessarily allow us to bring on a large water user uh, that would come to the city. Um, if uh, something large came to the city, such as a, a pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing or chip manufacturing, we'd have to look at how we would address that and how we could treat that water in order to get it to them. Um, but with the current rate of growth that we have and the current water usage that we have, we are comfortable waiting until 2029 to do that. All right, thanks. Okay, so uh, where are operating revenues used? So this graph um, is intended to reflect it's a percentage on the left there. So that orange line represents 100% of operating revenues. Um, the gray bar being operating expenses, so that's normal operations O&M. The yellow is debt service. The blue is capital outlay, system renewal capital outlay. Um, and so any time the, the stacked bars exceed the, the orange um, operating revenue line. That means that we're either using reserves um, to fund this additional expense um, or we may be issuing debt to fund that additional expense. Um, but really the intent here was just to show that um, that we, we have been exceeding our operating revenues in the past and in the last four or five years you can see a trend that's going upward now, partly that's driven by increased debt um, service costs, um, and part of it is increased capital investments. Um, so, challenges with the rate study forecasting inflation is always a challenge. Um, operating income has been less than we anticipated over the, the recent past. Um, 2023, in particular, was a very wet year. Um, Operating revenues in 2023 were 10% below operating revenues from 2022, um, and uh, about 17% less than we were projecting for 2023. Um, uh, there are significant increases in the identified capital investments. Um, when I say previously 30 million, now 173 million, that previously meant in the 2020 rate study. Um, so updating that now, um, we reflect a significant increase of 173 million in capital. Um, and then part of that has to do with the timing of, of the master plan. So in the 2025 budget, um, we included a master plan update. Um, that master plan update will take a year to two, two years, so we won't have it immediately, um, but we will have it ahead of the three-year rate schedule that I was talking about. So as the three years wraps up, we'll have a current master plan, the associated capital improvements associated with that, and then we can look at what our capital needs are going to be over the next five years. Um, so assumptions that we have actually in the model, um, I did assume 5% inflation. 
Um, we're also assuming that if we issue debt, it would be um, at our standard, our current rate. So we're currently double A rated bond. Um, we do anticipate some customer growth. We see customer growth every year. Um, that's in the number of customers, not in the use per customer. Um, and then demand similar to kind of our five year average. Um, we do anticipate conservation um, bringing that down somewhat at 0.5% here. I think what uh, Hoke showed was 3% over the five years, so that's 0.6. Um, and then additional debt issuances may be considered. Um, so this slide, a lot of numbers there. The top row, debt coverage ratio. So the debt coverage ratio is represents how much money you have to pay your debt. So we have one and a half times to cover our debt um, uh, is the target that we're setting. So we want to have some margin there. Um, then you look at how much net pledge revenues you have. So you take in your operating revenues, you have non-operating revenues, you pay your operating expenses, what you're left with is called the net pledge revenues. Um, the net pledge revenues are then allocated to existing obligations, so existing bonds, um, and then potentially available for additional bonds. So that available line there is then used to calculate the available debt capacity, um, assuming that AA rated um, debt and looking at it on a 20 year or a 30 year um, time frame. And then down at the bottom is where, so I guess, Stepping through that in 2029, uh, we'd have about $184 million worth of debt capacity in 20 year debt or $236 million in 30 year debt. Um, then down below, it talks about proposed issuances. So the first being the $32 million for Nelson Flanders site work. That is $32 million that we is left with the, the authorization that um, was sought from, uh, from citizens in 2019? 2020? 2020. Um, so that uh, we already have authorization for. Um, what we would need to go and ask for additional authorization for would be the Nelson Flanders expansion, which you see in 2029. And then potentially this distribution main replacement program, um, which on the previous slide was $44 million. We would be potentially looking at issuing debt for $35 million of that $44 million. Um, so with that, um, then we're going to look first of all what our forecasted revenue requirements are. Um, so the revenue requirements consist of the dark blue bar, the O&M expense, the orange bar, the capital outlay, the light blue bar, um, debt service on top. Um, and then there are some other revenues other than operating revenues that, that come in that will partially offset this. Um, so we're looking at two to five million dollars there. Um, but you can see from the, the green line that our current revenues are not going to meet all of those. Um, revenue requirements. Um, so, ways to close that revenue gap. We could issue revenue bonds. Um, and issuing revenue bonds is appropriate for long-term capital investments, um, generational investments. Um, essentially, you're going to ask the customers for the next 20 to 30 years to pay off this debt, so they need to be benefiting from whatever infrastructure they are paying for. Um, we could delay capital investments. Um, we did look at that. Uh, Nelson Flanders expansion has been delayed um, as far as um, we feel we could comfortably do. Um, we can use existing available reserves um, to, to cover that shortfall, or we can look at increasing rates. Um, and I put these kind of in order of, of how we try to look at them. So increasing rates is something that that does need to be done occasionally, but um, but we want to look at all of those other things before we get to increasing rates. Um, 
So, as I said, um, we are proposing issuing some debt, $147 million over the next five years. Um, we did propose delaying Nelson Flanders expansion. It's only one year at this point, but, um, but it's as far as we could go. Uh, and then we would propose using some of the available reserves, 15 to 20 million dollars, or three to five, four million per year. Um, but we are still going to need to look at adjusting rates, so it's 9 to 9.75 percent each year going forward for the next three or five years. So the options presented were option A was a five year schedule. Um, and again, looking at this, I try not to change the colors. So the dark blue is O&M, the orange is capital, the light blue is debt. The other revenues to offset it is that green bar. And now on top of that, it's that I'll call it salmon, but the very bottom bar is the use of reserves. Um, now what I will say is that we're still not getting that green bar above um, the blue bar there, uh, the, the, the stack chart. Um, and in the three-year schedule, we're also not quite getting it above there, but we're saying over the next three years, we'll, we'll make adjustments in rates um, because we know some adjustment is going to be necessary. Meanwhile, we're going to update our master plan, develop our CIP going forward, um, and then we will come back and talk about rates at that point. Um, getting down to what that really means for the average citizen here. Um, so residential water service um, would be going up four to four or five up to six dollars per month each year. Um, now looking at how that compares to neighboring communities, um, you can see the, the dark orange there is really where our average bill is, um, and it would be going up $4.46. Um, wouldn't really change where Longmont is relative to the other communities. Um, this is not considering any increases that other communities may have, so um, it's likely that uh, Broomfield, for example, might be above us. Um, then the lighter orange bar reflects where our customers that are eligible for our Longmont Cares program, um, where their water rate would effectively be at the end. Um, so it will be going up about $2.77 per month, um, but still uh, lower than almost anyone else, um, depending on what Louisville does. Um, and then looking at the whole utility bill, uh, so there are other increases coming in 2025. Electric rates are going up about 6%, so that's that $5.71. per month. Per month. Um, and the water rates here, that 446 we talked about. Wastewater had another rate increase uh, before 339. So in total, we're talking about uh, the bill going from $219 to $232. So um, an increase of about 6%, I think, is what that worked out to. Um, and then for those customers on CARES, um, they're getting, currently, they're getting about a $38 rebate. That in rebate would increase to $46 um, in 2025. Um, so the effective increase for those customers is a $5 increase on their, their utility bill. Um, and that's really it. Then I got to the, the point of the council's discussion and seeking direction there. So. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, sir. You might want to start. If you have some questions, I know. <laughs> yeah, okay, I can start with I uh, sent some questions to, to Ron and 
Um, I, I think the first one was looking at the difference in the rate uh, between that of the city of Longmont residents and what we're providing and the cost for the town of Lyons. Pretty significant difference. Why, are, why is Lyons getting water, the increase at like $3 and um, the resident of Longmont four, four and a half dollars Right, so, so Lyons is a wholesale customer. Um, meeting what? Meaning that they're providing us raw water. We're treating that water for them. We're then providing that water to Back them through a pipe that is their pipe. So they're not paying for any of the distribution system in, for, in Longmont because they're not uh, using that distribution system. Um, so that increase that we're talking about really should only be a part of what Lyons' water rate increase needs to be, um, but it's on the treatment portion. The other question that I had was more policy issues where the medians and the arterials are exempt from, from this perspective, any of the increases. And I'm just curious, you know, based on my experience and what I've seen is that many of the medians are not managed well and, and excess water and it would make sense at least from a water conservation perspective to in, include those and encourage water conservation in our arterials and, and medians and I assume that's a policy decision um, and I know planning and parks and a lot of folks are looking at the landscape maintenance um, standards and that may you know come into consideration at that point in time too, but I would strongly recommend that we not exempt the arterials and the right of ways and medians from this. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think there's some great um, policy recommendations also in the in the water efficiency plan <coughs> around setting water budgets for, for those kinds of things and yeah. kind of comparing usage. So, um, yeah, a good conversation to, to initiate. I've got a quick question. So, if I read that correctly, the water rates are going to be increased. Basically, was it ten percent a year? Mm -hmm. Did you say for the next five years? Yes, three. 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 Mm -hmm. And what did we do the last five years, roughly, on water rates? So we had a we had a descending rate increase. Um, I think this year water rates went up six percent. Um, so they went up 6% this year, I think it was about 7% last year and 8% the year before. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was based on the rate study that was done right before the pandemic um, <laughs> um, and the rate schedule that was adopted right before the pandemic. Uh, so. so percentage increase is less going forward than what we had the last few years basically percentage wise. Is that correct? No, no, it's gonna be more. I thought you said it was something like seven or eight percent previously. Yeah, and now it's gonna be closer to ten percent. Okay, that's right. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Does staff have a recommendation on a three or five year I, plan? I think we made a recommendation, but council went with the three-year plan. Because, okay. yeah. you know, mainly, if we had to, then we adopted the five-year plan, we could still raise rates in the third year if we needed to to stay sure. solvent. So mm -hmm. we just decided to... That's <laughs> Council policy that the water board not give any comments, proposed water rate forecast prior to it going to city council. I mean, is that 
Right, so I've been with the city for six months, so I'm not sure what we had previously done. Um, I have in the past presented water rates to a water board, but um, but I'm not. I think Becky maybe can answer that question. There. Yeah, it's, it's my understanding that the uh, the the area of, of expertise in the board is primarily in water rights and uh, water supply. Uh, you know, if if that's not accurate, we should be bringing other policy issues here. So we'd be happy to do that. So I'm thinking back farther than my brain wants to, but uh, we did, in order to keep the rate increases lower in the 2018-19 era, we, we reduced our <coughs> shares of Woody Gap, did we not? So there is a precedent for um, Oh, Lord, Lord, help me figure that out. <laughs> it was very sad. <laughs> so it goes to council. It's been to council. Sec second reading? Second reading, yes. If you have a recommendation about how this could be avoided, um, that might be worth a, a disruption on second reading. You know, that's what second readings are for. We couldn't think of anything. thoughts on that? I would welcome seeing rates. Um, I would welcome helping council with rates um, and seeing rate presentations before the first reading or however council would like to direct. Right. Well, uh, uh, I, I, I actually don't, you know, council is pretty passive about we take it as it comes to us. Right. Um, you know, if you would like a motion that the future rate increases be passed by the associated board, um, we can do that. Or you can just bring future rate increases to us, whatever you I, like. I, I would mention that there are no other boards that review rates before they are proposed to council. Yeah, it's because the um, other rate things don't have boards, and I've tried to get them for the last five years. <laughs> but interestingly, the associated directors don't want a board. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would question that because I understand that the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board review annually when there's great great hikes for yeah. like access to Union Reservoir or some of those other things. Uh, so Vermont. utility rates are, are I'm set just saying, on cost of service and are generally not reviewed by uh, boards, but council can direct, you know, yeah. council wishes to direct. So it, it, you know what the thing that I would think about and, and frankly policy wise I have for example, I don't know those rules, that, including the one you just cited, yeah. Becky. What I do know is that the council has not clue one what we could do to mitigate the rate increase, the rate, the rate of increase of rates. Um, so some knowledgeable organization is going to have to think about it first. We did have um, a real anomalous situation where. Uh, a redefinition of rates uh, changed the electric the burden of the electric rates on the average rate payer in about 18 2018 I think but but that was that was just weird mm. um, we, we put in the we we, we um, made high consumers pay a bigger share of the uh, increase for uh, the meters mm -hmm. and also um, the original rate suggestions uh, required that uh, residents pay for the whole share of the meters because commercials weren't getting new meters, but the 
commercial people were benefiting from the projected changes that the meters would get, so that didn't seem right. And so we re it, and that did come from council, but it was, I, that was anomaly, you know. It just so happened that one of us had done this in a previous life. <laughs> you wouldn't expect that. Well, not to put you on the spot, Marcia, but how do you feel about some input from the water board on um, rates, water rates? Well, I would be happy to hear input from any source that would make it easier on consumers. So, you know, again, this is not a design from the council, so we don't have any, um, any pride of, of ownership in it. We are just the ones who take the fall and answer the letters and so on. So I don't, um, you know, I, I, I don't even remember the way the conversation went when we decided to use, you know, reduce our shares in Windy Gap. I don't remember whose suggestion that was. That might have come from council. It was, we regularly reviewed our participation level and as, as we were updating our future water demand evaluations mm -hmm. and our future demand was going down yeah. with conservation and we adjusted it and, and that really was a continuing effort on the water board yeah. to look at the numbers and look at demand and um, was, I thought, a, a very good process for yeah. Water Board to review that and make recommendations. Well, and, and the, there's kind of a, um, there's, there's two issues that, are, that, got, that were toying, intertwined back then, because on the one hand, the, our, the size of our shares in Windy Gap um, was, you know, there was a big discussion between Water Board and the staff, as I recall. Um, and the council got involved with that, and I think it was part. It was an election issue in 2017, as I recall. Yes. Um, and then uh, it was discovered later, by you know, by falling back, that we could moderate the rate increase a bit, and we and we did that. And that's what I don't I don't reckon, I don't recall anything about how the process went where that recommendation came to council, but council was happy to make the number smaller. Yeah, it, it seems like uh, having been part of the board and part of that conversation, that was a lot. But moving forward to the future, it, it feels like the water treatment plant is, frankly, a really big ticket item mm -hmm. um, and is the new kind of issue to figure out. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big ticket item. You know, they're like, who? Who monitors what's the right time to consider issuing the new debt, and who monitors whether the um, whether there are fluctuations in in uh, capital in materials costs for that? You know, sure as a council. And, and based on my rate experience elsewhere, it might be who council to consider asking staff for a presentation around a financial plan that addresses those exact issues. It looks at debt service coverage, looks at timing of projects. I'm a little concerned we're our backs against the wall on the water treatment plant. Um, but looks at like fund balances and if you can do the rate increase well before you need the treatment plant so you have some reserves to help pay for it and it's mm -hmm. not just debt issuance. Because um, I gotta say a ten percent rate increase for the last and then going forward. It's a pretty long window of 10% increases. Yeah, it's a big, and, and that's And those, those end up being doubling it. <laughs> yeah. Pretty so, quick, doubling the bill. Excellent. So we are in for the, the shorter of the series of, of increases. So we could follow that with an amendment that says, we would like the water board please to monitor this and see if we can bend that rate at any point in the next five years based on. Or the next 10. Like, yeah. I mean, it might right. be that it backs against the wall. Yeah. But. 
This, yeah, and we don't know what we, we don't want. To, we don't think there's a way to um, delay Nelson Flanders any longer. Yeah. But maybe we could do some financial tricks to delay the cost of starting, or to reduce the cost of starting that Nelson Flanders. So, yeah. Boy, uh, I could use some some bullet points or something because I'm willing to make the motion, but I'm not sure that I'm um, knowledgeable enough about the financial language to get it right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Did you guys? I'm, you looked at three and five. Mm -hmm. Did you look at a longer period of time? Yeah, our financial well, plan includes you know. You know, like a ten-year. Right I'm now. just thinking reducing the increase to the individual, but prolonging that over a longer period of time so and it's not quite the big hit. That's really what the, the debt issuances will do, that, those 20 and 30 year debt issuances for the generational projects is, is spread those costs out over, you know, current and future users. Um, but, you know, we have to be able to issue the debt in time to start the project. Right. Um, otherwise we, we can't hit the go button. <laughs> and we still have a bit of a window to move around in terms of when we issue the debt. Not very much. Not very much. <laughs> pretty tight. We're, we're pretty tight. <laughs> Which puts a lot of risk in what happens in the market in the next X amount of months, right? It does. And, and then you're dealing with little or no reserves and some options there too. Okay? I, mean, I mean, I know everybody knows this here, but we're really catching up. And utilities are on the back end of all the inflation that's happened over the last five years. And five years ago, we anticipated 3% inflation, mm -hmm. and that's not what's happened. I, I mean, you can see from the numbers that Nelson Flanders was estimated at a 50 to $55 million project. Now it's a $95 million project. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, and we were very fortunate to issue <coughs> debt in 2021 at some two percent rates. Yeah. Like yeah. that was really good. Yeah. Yeah. But the you know the remaining authorization that we have, you know, we're real, we really are timing the markets and just waiting to see what happens. Right. Um, but, yeah, but that um, issuance did allow us to move Montgomery Tank forward, yeah. Yeah. which could have been a major failure in the system. Yes. But we're moving forward on that now. So. Okay, but um, having a discussion about this and, and you know maybe having a presentation about this because the public does not know. You know, I've answered the letter that, you know, comes and says, well, wait a minute, this huge rate increase, we thought we were done with inflation. And I said, well, we are, you know, and I made it back down to 3%, but this was caused by the 9% 10 years ago. And they don't think of it that way, just like they think that, that their grocery should go back down. You know, not the way it works, but that's what they expect. Well, maybe we could internally discuss within the board is what we think might be pertinent. Or not pertinent. You know, I, I can't believe some input if it makes some sense will be yeah. valued. Absolutely. So yeah. we want to talk to each other <laughs> and hope we help by that discussion, so why don't, why don't we have kind of a discussion with ourselves and see what we think is uh, maybe some appropriate suggestions, and then we'll just Right back. now or next month? Uh, next month. Oh, okay, well, because, I mean, if I'm going to make any recommendations before we pass the, the rate tomorrow on second reading, I need to make a motion. Now, Obviously, you can change the rates anytime you want, really. But if you want something, you know, on the table to be said tomorrow, I would need some language by tomorrow. If you don't think that we need to do that, then I'll just let it go back. Well, and I don't know that I don't think you need to do that, but I think it's a little late in the game, really. Yeah, the, the I, I'd rather have the discussion before yeah. a first reading. And that this the timing is not, to me, Right to do anything different than what's being done. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. So, we're on to a second reading tomorrow. I, I don't yeah, have talking yeah. points for you for tomorrow. Okay, so we're on to a second reading tomorrow, and in terms of the, the most immediate needs for revenue increases, we got to do this for the next couple of years, mm -hmm. or we won't have enough money. Right. I, I do salute council for picking the three-year option rather than the five-year option. I think that gives a better true up and a little more 
chance to look into it. Why don't we get back with you? Pardon me? We'll get back with you. Okay. Once we decide amongst ourselves what makes makes it. But I think some dialogue, you knowing what we think, and vice versa, I, I, I think that's healthy. So you meet in November, but not December, is that right? Or you don't meet again until No, we meet both. Both meet. Okay. December. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Third Monday still. Okay. It's the sustainability board that doesn't meet in December. Uh, yeah, well. Because <laughs> that's not sustainable. Yeah. So, um, given that this is kind of a, a big deal, um, uh, either Roger or Ken would, would or, or Heather would, would you set me, because you guys are one of the few boards that is set up for hybrid meetings. So would you loop me in? Because I'm not going to necessarily be in town at those times. Yeah, we could do that. Thank you. We might be able to take a the challenge. Any, any other <laughs> questions on this issue? Appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, welcome to Longmore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hope you like it here. We're a lot of fun. All right. Thanks again. Okay. Water resources, engineering projects. Joe. So, unfortunately, Joe had a death in his family and uh, has been gone for a little bit. Later. Uh, Polly was not able to come this afternoon. So, instead of getting the five cent tour, I'll give you the one cent really quick tour of what's happening. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, I don't know if we want to try and deal with the computer or not. Um, I think most of you have an idea of where things are that we've been talking about. Um, so we can just go through them. Um, Holly's been working on our North St. Brain supply line that uh, comes from Button Rock, uh, basically down Highway 36 uh, to the treatment plant. Um, they did a reline project. It was about 1,800 feet long, about 900 feet upstream and downstream from where um, US 36, it's Highway 66. Um, and uh, that project has just been wrapped up. Uh, they're doing a couple of minor things with the cathodic protection, but it's basically done and was put back online on October 1st, which was a, a good thing for our treatment plant. Uh, they were operating without the North St. Brain line, and we were taking water from the Highland uh, in the time that it was down. Um, so that's been a, a major accomplishment and uh, a very good project uh, that reinforced that pipeline through there. Um, actually, right before they started, we had had a, a hole in the pipe that sprung a leak that was about that big around and was spraying water all over uh, the highway. And uh, our operations guys were able to fix that and keep it running until we could get this lining in. So, um, that line was installed, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ken, but around 1946, I believe? Um, 57. 57 was that, that section. Um, so it's been in the ground a long time, and uh, uh, it was a good project to get done. Um, Holly is also working on other segments of that line uh, for future years as well. Um, and right now we're reevaluating or evaluating uh, some of those fixes that we have. Um, the other thing that Joe wanted me to mention was the South St. Brain pump station. Uh, that was constructed a couple years ago, um, but had uh, a lot of issues associated with it. They also had um, a problem with flooding uh, right after it was constructed. Uh, the uh, vault filled with water. Uh, they fixed all those problems, um, and they are scheduled to start it up this next week to do some vibrational testing on it. Um, with the intent that we'd be able to use it next water season um, and be able to use our water rights out of the South St. Brain. And Ken, tell me that's one of our most senior water rights that we have. Uh, one of the first water rights the city acquired, yeah, right? The city water right, yeah. So that's a, a good thing. Um, and then the last one I had on here was Price Park Tank. Uh, 
which is in operation right now. And uh, if we get done here in a little bit, we can get up there and take a look at it. Um, if everybody interested in that? I won't be able to, but I can see it from my walks with my dog every day. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I've been watching that for a long time. I, I probably won't be attending that. Yeah, if you want to see it. We'll, we're, let's come over to your house now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, there we go. <laughs> Before or after the... Oh, uh, that's up to you. <laughs> well, if you're willing to... Really after do. five, I think. Would you, would you do that? Oh, certainly, yes. We can go up there and take a look at... Um, yeah, we won't be able to go in any of the structures. Uh, the tank has water uh, that's full. The pump uh, facility is underground, so we won't be able to go in there. Uh, but we can look at uh, each of the things that they constructed there. I, I think one of the major things is that we've taken the old two million gallon tank and the seven million gallon tank and consolidated into an eight million gallon tank, which is a much smaller footprint than it was previously. So. There's additional yeah, park space out right. there, um, and a lot of other improvements. Uh, it's amazing how much park space. Right. Yeah. I mean, it double what was there. Yeah, it seems at like least. That. It's really quite more usable too. Yeah. 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 I'm trying not to make it a one-to-one -one slope on the space. park space. I do. So. Okay. We got some interest, so I appreciate that. Thanks. Um. Any comments on our major projects listing that anybody wants to concern or agree with it or nothing? Okay. Ken, nothing. Um, I don't think there's any more informational items. No, they were attached to my packet. That's okay. all. <clears throat> Cash and Lou, we're going to look at. December? Um, we will. If I would like to uh, bring up one slide, just an information update for the board. You may recall um, the board had made a recommendation to increase the cash and lieu based upon the when you get permitting project. Um, we had originally scheduled that um, at the end of October. Unfortunately, the council meetings have gotten like mega. Uh, filled um, this fall, and so um, because we won't be initiating that increase until next year as part of the recommendation, it we, it did get slid until the December 10th, uh, <coughs> and that's when we'll, we'll go to Waterloo or to City Council, excuse me, to take that recommendation. Um, With the idea, it'd still be effective in January. Yeah. Correct. Well, I probably won't be able to make the January 1st because um, we're, we'll be taking it to the study session in December, which then means only I can't get scheduled until the 1st of January. So it might be late January, early February. Yeah. the end of the world about this. moved out a month. Well, we haven't actually had any cash and move come in only in a year. <laughs> so, well. We want to yeah, be ready. We, when, when we, we will be ready, yeah. yeah. So it won't, it won't hurt anything. It won't spoil it, but yeah. I just want to let the board know that it, it's going to be just a little bit later, but it'll, it'll still okay. go to council. So you're anticipating cash and would be effective at the end of January? Ye yes. Like we have to set a date. Approves, we got to not to overstep know, that, but. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll have that conversation about okay. um, and It'll depend on when I can get back on that. Council General, we're gonna we're gonna do it as a study session uh, because it is you know a little bit bigger increase and to highlight the fact that we're gonna try to do them just once a year you know on a set of schedule just get all that information to council so yeah it's a process and I know it's a big bite but yeah but, but let's try to keep but it. I think we're still yeah on track one of the things I liked about the new plan was the January first yeah. increase and I know yeah. you can't but if we can move towards that. Keep it close, yeah. and then next year. Next year we'll hit it. <laughs> next year we'll hit it. Next year. Yeah. Good. Uh, I don't know if there's any other items to bring up. Anybody got anything else? Did we not at last month's meeting talk about, and maybe it's in the bylaws about issues like the open space bond issue and having a a discussion related to 
so, something of that nature, you know, where the board is asked to provide support outside of maybe this expertise to the city council. I think Tom brought that up last month, that we might have a further discussion about a process by which we, we might do that in the future. Then ringing a bell? Yeah. It's foggy to me, to be honest with you. I, th I think it was more of a question about a process by which the general public came to a variety of boards, and, you know, not just this board, and asked for their support for yet another issue back to oh, council. Yeah. And, and whether there was a precedent or how we wanted about to deal with that. Yeah, issue. some of it, like the, yeah. the ballot issue. Yeah. And, and if we wanted to have a discussion about a process by which that happens again or could possibly happen again. Again, I think the bylaws. I think he kind of did ask the question. Yeah, that's, the only, that's the only thing I can think of. Do you remember that conversation, Ken? Yeah, and, and we, we have not said when we do it. And I guess internally we thought that it would make sense to look at that when we do our next review of the bylaws and have that conversation for one or two meetings before that and, and make that decision at that point as part of our bylaws. We can certainly do it before, we can, you know, we can do it anytime. Yeah, we don't have it on our schedule to do it right away, <laughs> and we'd be happy to bring that back sooner if preferred, but I think I think having that as part of our bylaw, our well, annual bylaw review. Would we don't really have a position on it, and that's the situation. Yeah. That, you know, if we want to make a position. Tom had brought that up. Yeah. I, 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 no. Right. And then based on today's discussion, is there a time when we want to talk about our role in, I'm even looking at the bylaws and it doesn't say anything about our review of water rights. Water rates. I, I understand that, but the response was we were only looking at water right type issues. Bylaws very, well if you look at the municipal code, but which is, is what is referenced in the bylaws, um, the purview of the water board is strictly to the water rights aspects of the water. It doesn't say anything about rates. So if that's a discussion that we want to have oh. at some point in time. So it's a bylaws amendment if you guys are going to participate in that. It would need to be a code, a um, municipal code in the, the charter amendment, amendment to the board's okay. charter, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I guess my question would be, is there, are there other things that we would want to provide input to <clears throat> and maybe not be so narrow as Strictly water rights. Okay. Uh, we can we can bring that. I think that's a good broad topic conversation right. to schedule in a time where we have less. And maybe that's a good agenda. annual. Yeah. If we're looking at legislative parameters every year, we might as well be looking at our purview on a regular basis too. Yeah. So you know what was in my mind with that little red herring discussion was, um, well, it was really pretty much, but. So the, the, the rate group, Becky's folks, are really thinking about finance. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You know, yeah. Only finance. And you guys are right now not thinking about it at all according to the charter, although there have been discussions that affect the water rates and decisions that have, you know, advice that affected them in the past coming out of this, this discussion. But there, there are other things like the state of the industry that I bet in the city nobody's monitoring. So for example, um, in the private sector when we were building or selling um, uh, electricity infrastructure of various sorts, um, you're looking at somebody watching how much other organizations, comparable organizations right. were paying, what the bids and asks were like. Because somebody gets a warning about, well, when we really start Nelson Flander, what are our surprises going to be? And I don't think it's, a, a, I don't know if it's anybody's job in the city right now to look at that kind of stuff until you do get ready to start it. And then it's engineering, but that's late. Right. So th that's what I would like to see in the discussion. Sometimes. 
say. Any other comments? Diane. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> any comments? You, you know. I, I do. I, I want to weigh in on this. We did ask um, the um, land smith for timing and dollars in terms of those projects. Um, initially, like I said, we committed to the three year. The first year is a six percent rate, and then it goes to ten or 10.3, depending on which category. And so I think it, we would very much like some support from the water board. If you don't want to insert yourself now before the before we approve the second reading, perhaps we do it you know, within the year. Because what we also wrote in is that we're going to review it every year. So if you could look at it this year, I think 6% would be agreeable as a rate increase for, I don't know. I, th I think it's high anyway, but, you know, that's where we went with, with the request. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. And so if you can work on it within this year and, you know, as we go to review it, which we review during the budget process, so by October, we could have in September, let's say, yeah, input right, from right, the right, water right. board. Okay. Right. Because when it came down to what other options do we have for raising revenue, we were all like, there are yeah, nothing. Yeah, yeah, we got nothing. <laughs> right, you guys have a lot of. Um, not, I don't know the ideas. Water board's going to do a bank sale. Um, you know, they're all talking to You know what I mean? Oh it's so, right. <laughs> everybody wants to hear me ask them for money. Yeah. But um, I think more visibility for for y'all definitely could come from this board, and and more visibility for us would be good too, because. And then I think that also gets a little bit more visibility for the community. Because if there is a 10% rate increase, I think the community really deserves a lot of information on why that's happening. Mm -hmm. And understanding of what they're paying for. Yeah. And, and how long that might last. Yeah. And, you know, what return they'll get on their investment. Yeah, I think sharing information is an important thing. Yeah. I agree. Well, very good. And we apologize. We didn't say, look, have we talked to the water board yet? But it would that's be my inexperience. And, and yeah, actually, yeah. I think this was a new experience based yeah. on my experience on the water board, which is almost 10 years. Um, so it was great to see it, um, but we'd like to see more. Okay. Appreciate your comments. Yeah. And I will second the motion, or we'll come up with some way to introduce, let's get the water board input for the next year. Yeah. Um, we, we, see, we could do just that much tomorrow night. Uh, yeah, I think that would But, be. hey, if you can do that, I think that's important. Oh, you betcha. Yeah. <laughs> to put the thought out there. Okay. Yeah. So we're not surprising people and see see what the reaction is. I, I was pleased with your reaction. And maybe there's, you know, maybe that's something that people would want to hear. I, I also think that there can be a lot one of the things that helps with information and understanding is an affordability analysis that goes along with the rate setting. And it doesn't have to be involved, it doesn't have to be hard. It can be something as simple as how long it takes to work at minimum wage to afford an average monthly indoor water bill. Mm -hmm. That's well, that's not hard and that's kind of one of the metrics that's floating around in the water industry of this is this is what this is doing to and the minimum wage number is kind of like your 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 lower income folks that need to be affording stuff and, and can they? Yeah. Um, and and policy discussions about that way back, several years ago, not necessarily as such, but that's why we have the CARES program. That's why the um, rate um, analysts are directed to, to roll in the impact of, on the CARES program every single year. And that's why we do have a more complicated uh, consumption-based electric rate. Isn't it? That would be, you know, are our water meters smart enough that we could have consumption-based rates? You now we have a new we have a new billing system, so you, you probably got all kinds of opportunities to make over waterers pay more. And I'm sorry, I have to take this. Call. Um, we're just we do do that. The the affordability thing? Yeah. Hello? I can't remember where it is. Yeah. But I can try. Um, no, I'm in a board this meeting is that is meeting. just yeah, yeah. ending. But it's, it's, um, because it's totally valuable, but here. I think it's a great thing to fold so into I was from chatting, but there's an um, accountability element and a have to do it with the people. 
What's up? What are you doing to people? Yeah. Because rates are such a big deal. Or, yeah. You know, it's an annual, right. or it's a monthly touch from your utility. And it's in your pocket. Mm -hmm. So that's just good. All right, Would you have time to put in, give us input before the end of the year? Or in January? I'm thinking about writing an email as quickly as I can. It could take me a week, but <laughs> but you know, like, because I think we could as delay a board. it that long, and certainly we could ask. I know we have in the past for other boards. Yeah, and I'm not. Topics. I'm not sure I want to blow up rates yeah. the yeah. night before second reading. Yeah. Uh, steady, steady right. is good. Yeah. Um, more drama is good. More visibility is good. That's my values on this, and that's why I'm saying yeah, I think can we get more review, but not necessarily change things for tomorrow. Okay. If we rush it, I think that could have a negative connotation. I would just okay. it's going to call a lot more attention to it too. Frankly, it's going to be all of a sudden this is expected, and then it stopped. Yeah. So. Yeah. Why? And then you get a nice write up in the newspaper. Yeah, and you get a lot more publicity, which is not a good thing. You press on, and we'll have them call you, and then. <laughs> Next year will be part of your protection. Anyway, so just to be clear about the plan. So what we will say is, we, the water board wants to weigh in on this within the next year for future. That would be yeah, good. Future, future, that would future be good. rates, and, and then we'll we'll proceed with the six percent. But then, you know, when we go to review this, we'll definitely okay. have more information. All right, great. Good discussion. Anything else? All right, we're adjourned. Thank you.